Welcome to Searching for Mana, Ned Phillips. Hey Lloyd, how are you? I'm really well, how are you? Good, thank you. Fantastic. Ned Phillips is the um, founder and CEO at Bamboo, who are a robo-advisor who are based in um, Singapore. Ned founded uh, Bamboo uh, early in 2016 um, after a career of a couple of decades, uh, circa a couple of decades in traditional um, investment and wealth businesses, some names that we'll, we'll all know, such as E-Trade. Um, Ned's um, education was uh, economics and in the UK, um, and then uh, very much started off uh, in sales, in the sales function of investment and wealth businesses. Um, and I have seen people um, comment that Ned is the best salesman in the world. So we definitely want to uh, steal some of the, <laughs> the fantastic techniques that I'm sure he can um, appraise the audience through. Um, in terms of bamboo, um, it seems to be doing all the right things. I think, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not precisely sure Ned will, Ned will fill us in, but it's, it's around 70, 100 people right now. Um, certainly, they are award-winning and there just seems to be a really fantastic vibe around the whole business and the culture. So really excited to have you on, Ned, and to um, talk through all of the things that have happened at Bamboo, all the things that you're excited about happening moving forward, um, and obviously deep dive into a few other things. What would be really fantastic is if you could just um, talk to the audience about what you're up to right now with Bamboo, please. Sure. Well, Lloyd, I really appreciate that introduction. The, the gentleman who said I perhaps may be one of the better salesmen in the world is incredibly kind. He's a good friend, so he's biased. But I will admit that I love sales. And like anything in life, if you love doing it, you're probably a bit better at it than something you don't love doing. And I'm, I feel eternally grateful that I, I, you mentioned a couple of decades as well. I'm 53. So you, you actually could have said three decades, Lloyd, and still be <laughs> almost generous. Uh, and I do come from a sales background. So, you know, we can dig into a little bit of that more. But yeah, look, thank you. Bamboo today is we're a, what's called wealth tech. And like any company, you've got to get to that elevator pitch. And we design, build, and integrate saving and investment apps. So, Everybody likes to save and invest. You generally do it on a mobile or on a desktop and a financial institution provides you with that ability, that technology and with a company behind the scenes that designs and builds that. And you're right, it's been a four year journey. We've been super lucky to work with some of the biggest companies in the world. And right now, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I always enjoy saying what I think, we're trying to take over the world. So uh, what do you say, what are you doing right now? We're winning clients in America, we're growing and, uh, trying to take over the world, which normally doesn't end well, but we'll see how it goes. So I suppose when you categorize trying to take over the world, um, you know, the top umbrella category is just literally owning the whole thing. Um, that's one, that's one route. And then, um, which I'm sure you are, you are aimed at, um, in a given time frame. but the one that you're trying to take over, um, is where people can digitally, um, save and invest better. Correct. And, and yes. The and bid that, and sorry, the, yes. The bid that we want to take over is yeah. when a financial institution is thinking about, I need a better digital wealth experience for my customer or for my advisor. Who do I call? Well, not Ghostbusters, you call Bamboo. And I, I want to be the global leader. I want to take over the world of wealth tech and really, and I also expect our competitors want to do that too. So I don't mean any disrespect to them. I assume they also want to be the biggest and the best at it. And we are part of that as well. And you know, just how you describe it there, just um, I'll keep cutting into it until um, I understand it as a layman. Um, you said you want to help the institutes who want to do this. So you have um, in effect a technology and a white label product that then a financial institute would use um, to then give a better digital experience to the customer base they already have. That is correct. And we've worked with customers like HSBC, Standard Chartered, Franklin Templeton, and built them 
exactly that. Technology, which means their customers would have a delightful, wonderful, seamless experience when saving and investing, buying funds and portfolios. Fantastic. Why did you um, want to pursue that route versus being the um, facility that people directly lend, uh, sorry, um, save and manage their money through? Uh, I, I, I'm going to use the phrase that I've used before, because I'm not cool enough. What do I mean? B2C is all about cost per acquisition, right? So the Robin Hood effect in the US, that isn't Robin Hood wasn't started by 50 year old ex finance guys. It was started by 25 year old gamers, right? And I think the world of B2C finance has changed a lot. When I was in B2C finance at E-Trade in the nineties, you could simply say, I can trade stocks online and that was novel. That was amazing. Whereas today, if you do not have those critical digital marketing virality, how do you get the customers? And you know, huge funding. I don't think you can do a good, you know, whether it's a Revolut or a Monzo or a Robin Hood or a Scalable, you need hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire the accounts. And is, it, is, is there a bigger likelihood of being a unicorn if you do B2C? Absolutely. Is a B2B a more slower burn to get? But you know, if I only end up building a few hundred million dollars worth business in my 50s, I'll take it. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, a, it's a really sensible thing to appraise when you're an entrepreneur, um, which, which I'd put into the kind of risk category. So you are looking at what um, you desperately have uh, in additional value to the competition. So you look at your background and you look at the marketplace and you evaluate how aggressive do we need to be if we need to win this or if we need to share this market. And so you have raised that um, this route would give you more likelihood to be successful of something really special that you could be proud of that had an impact. But if you'd gone for the, you know, spin the dice, try and uh, go B to C, then that risk is so high that it, it is incredibly likely that one is to fail. Interesting and, and uh, absolutely correct, Lloyd. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, but in reality, I'm a, I'm a gambler by my DNA. Risk is something I love. So in essence, my DNA was like, let's go for the big ticket. But <laughs> at, the right time, at the right time, I met my co-founder who was, you know, he's from Finland. He's realistic, amazing, visionary, but he was clear. It's really understandable, but the tech, com the, the, excuse me, the, the financial institutions need this tech. And he was like, look, you can sell, I can build. Neither, I had experience in B2C, but not in the well space. So it just lined up, right? It, it wasn't that I was like, oh, I don't want risk. I love risk, but it just felt this, this, I mean, as you know, Lloyd, every startup is a roll of the dice, right? Every single one, right? This just felt like a, I don't know, a more fun, a more achievable, more realistic for us type of thing. And your experience of selling into the banks um, with that initial view that they certainly needed this type of um, technology um, is, is super interesting. So I'd, I'd like to know how you feel that that has changed from 2016 to 2020 in terms of their advancement and therefore their need for Bamboo's help. So in 2015, I was a consultant to a B2C robo advisor in Hong Kong called Eight Securities. So this was set up by two of my former colleagues from E-Trade called Matthias and Mikhail. Shout out to you guys, I wouldn't be here without you. And I was a consultant to them. So they'd started as an online brokerage in uh, early, in I think 2010. So they would do it, they'd gone from online brokerage to B2C wealth robo. They brought me in to look at the B2B possibilities. Could we also do B2B? And what I realized was the way the company was set up, the tech, the setup, the structure, B2B wasn't probably what they should do. But in that 10 months I was with them, 20 different banks were like, yes, we need that tech. Yes, 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 yes. So by the end of the 10 months, I said to Matthias and Mikhail, hey, look, I'm a sales guy. And there's people actually calling in, asking for stuff. <laughs> I'm just going to do this. Like, it's just, like, it doesn't happen. So what's changed? Back then, there was this, hey, we think we maybe need this thing called a robo-advisor, not sure. 2017, it felt like, okay, it may happen, robo, maybe. It's starting to come, we're seeing it, it's growing. 2018, ooh, ooh, we think we better have one of these. 19, dum, 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 drums banging. We were getting calls, we haven't made an out, 
outgoing sales call because we've worked very hard on digital marketing and there's so much demand. And in 2020, of course, COVID is not what any of us wanted, but has COVID increased the march towards digital? Of course. And so now we get incoming requests every day from global financial institutions saying this, I need a robo-advisor. Not I'm thinking about it, not I want it, not what is it. If I don't have a digital wealth solution today, I'm falling behind. And I think that has changed. And that's, um, that's fallen into your strategic hands fantastically well. Um, but um, if you think about the, the bank, they typically have a um, large resource, intelligent people. Um, perhaps we know that a bureaucracy stops them from always being agile, like a stealth startup. But nonetheless, are you not seeing them try and go at this themselves? How are they competing with, are you going to banks now and sometimes you're like, actually what we've got, they've already got inside or that's still non-existent, Ned? Yeah, like, like uh, Lloyd, it's a great question I get asked all the time, but I actually think the narrative around it isn't quite right. We've worked with many banks that are using us, building it themselves, buying a robo, uh, using other vendors. Remember, wealth is different for all of us, right? There's the first time investor, there's the, you know, Henry's, high owners, not rich yet. There's the ultra high net worth. There's people doing gold-based investing risk. So what I would say was this is, it's really clear that there's very few banks taking one strategy. Let's build it all ourselves or let's partner all the time, you know, partner by build. So they're trying them all in different variants. But what's incredibly clear, there isn't, and this is gonna sound nuts, there isn't enough B2B wealth tech out there. There's so much demand, like we, honestly, we pretty much can't keep up. There is, and it doesn't mean we sign deals every day, but every institution's looking for something different. And some come to us and say, I've already built a robot, but you seem to have an extra bit I need. Great. I haven't even started to build a robot. How can you help? Great. Or we've built it in this country, but how does it transpose to this country? So the question is, it's not, should they build it themselves? Should they not? It's a very small institution just takes one choice. Hey, I've got to do something. Whereas a large global institution, I'm guessing, and I'm guessing, please, any large financial institution, correct me. I'm guessing globally, they have anywhere between 30 to 50 wealth tech projects at one time. Yeah. So we don't need to win at all. We just need to yeah. win a little bit. We don't need to win at all. Yeah. And um, if you were to now think of um, the net effect of this to um, the individual who actually ends up using the various products, I'd love to go into um, some some advice and recommendations that, that that you would put out there if you're comfortable doing that. Before I do that, uh, I just wanted to to draw to the audience's attention that um, Ned has um, recently launched a fantastic podcast. Um, you are several shows into that, Ned. Um, I've listened to a few, and it is highly recommended that if anybody wants to. Um, understand wealth tech better and have it cut up in an incredibly uh, humorous and uh, <laughs> and uh, fun way, then uh, high recommendation. We will in the show notes put uh, links to that, of course. Um, what I really like about the show is it, I don't know, I'd, I'd say it's it's the um, the level of detail beyond certainly what searching for Mana is doing. So that's perfect for us to have a chat about this. What I'm enjoying about it is you know, I have a load of peers who are at that point where people are starting to think, okay, how do I manage my money really well? Um, what should I be investing in? This is, a, this is a vast topic, but your show is helping cut that up. Could you perhaps talk to us about um, some of the brilliant things that have come out of those shows and perhaps how you would explain that to somebody looking to, to, to go out there and seek the best digital tools? Lloyd, thank you. We appreciate the shout out. As a young podcast, we're learning from guys like yourself. We've already been doing it. I, when I first put out the first, the, the first podcast, I wrote on LinkedIn and Facebook, I really believe that the world needs another podcast. Of course, <laughs> the world doesn't need another podcast, yeah. particularly about wealth tech, particularly because for the 99.999% of people, it's not interesting. But what, you know, do, why do we do it? Two reasons, three reasons maybe. You know, we run a wealth tech business that's B2B. And what's important is our brand and our content and our thoughts on wealth tech. So we, you know, in this, particularly in this COVID world, the idea that 
you can just sell by meeting people. It's, it's disappearing. You've got to brand yourself. So really important. Secondly is we're super passionate. Like I use this phrase, and again, I, I mean all great love and respect to my competitors, but I personally believe this, and I think it's important maybe that I said, if there was a Olympics to build a robo advisor, and there was a team of 70 people to build the best robo advisor, I think Bamboo would get the gold medal. What, why? Well, I meant to, I'm the founder, right? But I also think is that it's all we do. We design and build it. And I, well, I was like, wow, when you launch a podcast like we're doing here, you get great guests who want to talk and they'll share ideas and they'll give you ideas. And so we can do that. And the last bit that we really thought is that the, as you've listened to it, it's myself who is old and apparently wise, but we will take the wise and Danny. So Danny, I believe is 26 uh, from Ecuador. She joined Bamboo right at the beginning uh, of her kind of career after university. And it's this interplay because obviously Danny knows Bamboo well, but with all due respect to her, she's not a wealth tech expert. So she is the voice of the customer. We get on people and we really enjoy that interplay. She's like, but why would I use it? Why would Danny use that? So I think we've managed to find a bit of a niche voice, which is, well, tech can be boring, Lloyd. Let's, let's, let's be honest here, and it can be dull. So we want it to be the non-dull, interesting brand, informative. And yeah. it's, been a huge amount, it's been a huge amount of fun. And um, Danny uh, is filling in the, or connecting the dots with, um, you know, one attribute I'm sure you hire for, which is passion and curiosity. Um, for your space and so you've got this brilliant combination of you know like you say your experience and then her finding it out on the show so that journey relates to somebody also trying to do that I love it that's amazing um, in terms of the topics you've covered so far Ned could you just headline some of those please sure our first episode was called why wealth tech sucks uh, we launched <laughs> with that so we thought that would you know you, 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 you need a you know what, what's that called a uh, uh, Clickbait, headline, right? Clickbait, yeah. um, <laughs> clickbait. Um, but, but honestly, you know, so one of our guests, so what have we covered? Wealth Tech Sucks, Super Apps in China, um, Marketing of Wealth Tech, uh, we've covered Sales in Wealth Tech, we covered Security, we covered DeFi, right? Range of stuff. But what we realized is, on, on one, of our, one of our shows, one of our guests said, let's face it, Nobody goes to their banking app for a, for, a, for a good Friday night app. And I really like that. Why? I get it. WealthTech isn't Netflix or Spotify, but it isn't good enough, right? It can be better. And I really believe we're all settling. Even Bamboo, we can do better. We must do better. Hey, buy a fund. Okay. But, but, but why? Why am I buying? Like, like, it can still be a good experience. So, yeah, WealthTech sucks. How to sell it. Security. And next week's episode, we have an eight-year-old investor who is going to explain his investing philosophy to us. So we should learn from the next, next or upcoming generation. You, you know, um, of course, as a family, you've got many things that um, make the whole thing so exciting, um, along with some stresses. For you, it's, you know, being that gold medal Olympic team getting that right that's a huge part of it possibly even number one right um and then there's also this market that just needs this solution so 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 that's that's a couple um and then there's also just well we could be successful in many different ways right now because it feels like we've got this this need and when you think about that if you were to take it out you know three five several years then what do you really hope if somebody said you'd achieve something and this is not about team, because I get you're super passionate about that, that it were to be. Do you mean Bamboo or Ned personally? Both. Okay. I have this, I have this belief. I want to be, and, and again, so I'll say the line, then we can decide how we quantify it. I want to be the global leader in wealth tech. So two points there. We're a little Singapore company and we, you know, we're making good inroads in America, right? We're not the Beatles. We haven't taken over America, but, you know, we have clients and we're growing and we have clients in Europe and we have clients in Middle East and we have clients in Asia. And we're one of the few firms who didn't bind ourselves geographically. So I want to be a, a recognized as a global and then leader. What does that mean? More revenue, more clients, recognized, 
I think it's a combination of all, but what I want is this. Three to five years, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. So I don't think I'll ever get here, but you know what my, my dream is? Oh, wealth tech. Oh, you mean bamboo. Wealth, bamboo means wealth tech. We, we're, you know, we're not the definitive, the only, we'll still have plenty of great competitors, but oh, when you think of wealth tech, you think of bamboo, that's it. I, I feel like the audience has got a really good view now of um, what bamboo's been up to, what it's up to right now, and some of the philosophies that run through the business um, and your charismatic leadership. Um, the, the show is um, searching for mana. And so, of course, what we want um, the audience to really understand is, um, you know, what's, what's been driving Ned through his career, some of the attributes that um, you feel have, have um, contributed to that success and some of the um, philosophies that you have through your career. Um, so a good way to do that is I, I want to really ask you to go back to the first time you thought about um, yourself having a career, being a businessman, if that's what you were thinking. This can even be before education. What you want to know what I was thinking my life would be as I started to approach adulthood or that first that that first moment that you really started to think, okay, right, I'm in the school or um, wherever it might be, you know, I feel like this is what I'm gonna go and pursue. It's a Lloyd, it's one of the best questions I've had for a long time because I haven't really thought, but when you said that, something came to my mind which stuck with which I don't, this doesn't exactly answer, but perhaps points me down that path. So I grew up, wonderful childhood, in a small town in central Scotland, and we lived out in the middle of nowhere. My parents were, uh, my dad's a lecturer, I'm a social worker, but we lived quite self-sufficiently. So grew our own vegetables, hunted our own meat, you know, um, and we, you know, lovely childhood, you know, and yeah, we were, you know, respectably middle class, whatever you call it, but we lived quite a hippie, what we might call hippie or alternative lifestyle. At the end of, and we live in the middle of nowhere. At the end of our road was a family who, for whatever reason, had a decent amount of money and they drove a Range Rover. So I walked to school every day. I walked back two miles every day. My parents were at work. They'd sometimes pick me up on the way home, but we had like an 800 pound beetle, right? Like an old, and I remember the first time, I can't remember, I was 12. Our neighbor came past in this brand new Range Rover. And he picked me up, said, hey, Ned, can I give you a lift home? And you know, he was our neighbor, like I knew the dude. He wasn't some strange dude. We knew the dude lived in, at the bottom of our, and our house was in the middle of nowhere. And, I, and this Lloyd, when you asked me, when I sat in that car, I was like, this, this, I want this. And I remember thinking, I was too shy to say, how did you get this? Like, I couldn't make sense of it. How does this happen? And oddly enough, so 40 years later, I'm 53, I'm not materialistic at all. I've been super lucky in life and managed to make some money. I don't really care about fast cars or whatever, but I think very quickly. And then when I got to university, when I left university, I didn't get a job. And I realized, oh, I've got no job. And my brother was in London, I was sleeping on his couch. And I saw an advert in the paper that said broker wanted. And I was like, oh, wow, I can be a stockbroker. Wow, awesome. And it said 18,000 pounds a year. I was like, wow, awesome. And it said OTE. I didn't know what that meant. And so I applied for the job, got the job, turned up. I was like, wow, I'm a stockbroker with 18,000 pounds a year. Of course, I was a door to door insurance salesman. 18,000 pounds a year was my on target earning. My actual earnings were zero. But I quickly realized, oh, so this sucks. But if I keep doing it, I start to earn a bit of money. And then I earn a bit more money. And I was like, oh, wow, I don't really like selling insurance. And I think very quickly I realized, I don't know if there's anything else I want to do, but I quite like this. And I started doing that. And so I think it was a combination of, I'm not materialistic, but like most people like to have money. And I saw a direct correlation between sales and doing it. So I used to have salesmen on my card. I used to have a business card said salesman. And people used to say, you shouldn't have that. You know what I mean? People think salesman's not a career, but I'm super passionate. Sales is a great career. What was it that you liked about sales? For whatever reason, I wasn't bad at it. Uh, you know, I'm quite competitive. I, I hope I'm a good loser, but I love, love winning. And I quickly found myself in a room full of sales guys. 
And in the old school, you'd have a whiteboard. And who sold the most? And if, if, if it wasn't me, wow, it would bug me. I don't know what that is, ego, whatever. But I, more than the money, more than the money, I really wanted to be the best sales guy in the room. And that made me happy. Why? I, I, you know, Lloyd, that's just a DNA thing. I don't know. But it does. And it wasn't always me that's, you know, uh, Jeremy Slade, if you're listening, I learned it from you, man. You went to, I sat opposite a guy uh, who taught me how to sell and some other people, but I've definitely, you know, learned from a lot of great people. But yeah, I ended up being not bad at it, made a good living. And it, my career kept going in the right direction. So kept doing it. Cheers for that, Ned. It's funny when you look back, isn't it? Um, I can relate to, um, you know, being in an area where um, there are really amazing materialistic stuff that certainly my family didn't have. Um, I got a scholarship into a school, which put me more into that type of domain. And, and you, you know, as, as, a, as a, a teen, you're envious of these things. Um, but um, then, you know, later when you define what's important to you, it, it means so little. And I, and I hear your story and I'm like, like your family sound very cool there. You know, you, you, uh, you have clearly uh, really great and bright parents. You had a Beetle, which is the much cooler car out of a Range Rover. <laughs> and a Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, it's it just, you know, it flips. But and w I don't hear from that anything that makes me understand why suddenly you wanted to be the guy on the top of the whiteboard apart from you're naturally competitive. Do you think that competitiveness came from anywhere? You know, Lloyd, a, I was talking with someone the other day about it. It's a great question. Like, I'm, I'm a super keen ultra runner at the, at the, well, not at the moment. Endurance sports has been my thing. And I, I don't know. Like, I don't know whether, so I have a phrase in life that I like to use, particularly in or bamboo or life. And, you know, I have kids who are 20 and 18. Relentless positivity, right? Just, it'll be okay. I know sometimes it won't be okay, but it'll be okay. Relentless positivity. So whether that's a DNA thing, I grew up in a household with you know, a lot of love and happiness. It was, it was fun. I maybe have had a you know, pretty good time in life. So I, the competitiveness, why do I need to win? I don't know. I do. Like, and and I, it, when I lose, I don't sulk. It's okay. I'll just keep doing it. And when I win, I hope I'm not a douchebag about it. And I hope I'm magnanimous and nice. I, 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 I hope I am. And when I lose, it's okay. I'm totally happy for the winner. And I yeah. don't beat myself up. But so, so I, on Lloyd, I don't know, but it burns super bright inside me. <laughs> so um, when I see this um, with sales individuals, um, then of course, part of it is exactly what you say. You've got to be able to have um, resilience because of course it's a discipline where there's, there's different levels of rejection, but that's going to come the whole time. And so to have your disposition of positivity, that's massively useful. Otherwise, you're not going to enjoy that task. And then I think one of the other things uh, is you need to have a level of fluid intelligence because um, you need to be able to react to the uh, conversation or the communication that is, is incoming. So I'm sure you've got incredibly high fluid intelligence. Um, and then I think you need to be able to manage your time incredibly well. You need to be able to think through how to proportion your day. It's a masterclass in... Um, Time management. Is there, is there anything on that that you think helps set you apart from your peers as well? Oh, Lloyd, it's like you read my mind. You're a master podcaster, sir. Um, a, a 15 years ago in my career, it became incredibly clear to me that I was good at one part of sales and terrible at the other part. They seemed to be okay with people, which I, I love and enjoy, but I was terrible at the follow-up, the admin, the time management, the proposals, all of that. And I realized that I should be a team of two. In fact, there was a colleague who had a team of two, like sales is a team of two, i.e. It's the analogy this gentleman gave me was this. You know, when you go to the dentist, when you arrive, there's somebody who meets you. Hello, please sit down. Thank you, Lloyd, it's 10 o'clock, good. Then when you go into the room, a, a dental hygienist, I believe they're called, puts on your bib, the little spittle thing in your mouth, uh, and then the dentist only does dentist work, right? And you think that's totally normal. But in the sales world, a salesman is meant to do it all, right? They're not doing dental work. And I realized, so at the moment, I actually counted last week on Zoom. I did, I think I did 48. I didn't get a 50. I did 48 meetings, right? 
sales meetings. Now, I don't do the follow-up. So I have a wonderful colleague called Melissa. Previously, I worked with somebody called Violi, a lady called Kit. And I realize I, as a salesperson, am unable to be as effective. And I would shout out to any salesperson out there. It might seem crazy to be a team of two, but if you're a team of one, unless you're incredible at time management, you're letting yourself down. You really are. That's um, absolutely brilliant advice. And, and in our world um, of headhunting, you have that team of two as well. You have the individual who, let's say, is client face networking, and then you have your researcher or resourcer who's really in the, the depths of cutting up candidate skill sets. Um, we're, um, we're, of course, both um, focused on finance. And I, I wondered how you could relate that relentless positivity um, to somebody who's in finance, who's um, trying to be positively productive? It's uh, a great question. Um, so you mean, who is it that I see in finance that has that similar relentless positivity? Or if, if, if they were to, um, how, or, or they're on the cusp, how could they utilize that sales mentality you have, but in their financial career? Yeah, like it's, a, you know, we've been lucky on the Wealth Tech Unwrap, the podcast that you mentioned. You know, we've interviewed some of the, the greats of Wealth Tech, Paolo Cerrone, April Rudin, Rich Turin. But as I listen back to each of the podcasts, I realize I like to interview positive people. So <laughs> I, and again, like, I get it. Some people have a more calmer disposition. I get it. I, again, why do I have this kind of higher energy disposition? I don't honestly know. Like I... I, it just is, right? We all are just are. Uh, but what I would say was this, is maybe in a sales perspective, you, you kind of touched on it, is that, okay, so I find myself surrounding myself with positive people. You know, I'm super lucky at Bamboo. I get to employ everybody. So I only employ positive people, super lucky. So every day I go to work, it's full of positive people. Wow, that's awesome. But if, if you're in sales particularly, don't let the no's ever get to you. And Here's the, look, you're in search. You get a thousand no's a day, Lloyd, right? That's how life works, right? But Sometimes what they're, they're not saying, yeah, more. <laughs> they're not <laughs> saying, hey, Lloyd, I don't like you. What they're saying is, hey, Lloyd, wrong time, wrong thing, not quite right. And I remember when I first started sale, you know, I was door knocking in insurance in London in 1990 in the rain, knocking on doors. Hello, I'm Ned. Bang. Hello. Went home, had a little cry, felt thought I sucked. Then I realized it's okay. And I think if you have the ability to let those negative bits go, if, you know, obviously people have different struggles in life, but that's what I would say. Like I, I, I let the negative stuff go. Like it's, it'll be okay. I think, I think, um, just to finish on this point, but it's, it's incredibly useful advice you're giving. Um, you've got to go into your career, be it in finance, be it sales and finance, whatever it might be. Um, you know, looking to, in some capacity, plow the fields um, in, that, in that period of your um, career. And actually, you know, not that you want to go fail, but building up a tolerance to not everything coming your way sets you up. And I see a lot of the entrepreneurs, certainly who I interview on the show or, or talk to, have had that type of exposure early on um, and shifted their mentality to be able to handle it and therefore are able to take various risks where they assess downward, okay, worst thing that happens is I die. You know, then second to that is that my property or securities are, are taken from me. Other than that, I've got egg on my face. And then actually now let's consider upside, right? Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, going and knocking on doors and uh, that first kind of career experience you had of learning what OTE actually means uh, probably put you onto the right type of trajectory. Um, in terms of uh, something you just mentioned there also, Ned, you said that you have managed to predominantly or solely uh, employ uh, positive people um, at Bamboo. Um, I'm, I'm curious uh, to ask a couple of things here. One would be, have you done that? What's been your process for sanity checking that? Hmm. Um, and again, Lloyd, I should be learning from you. You're in search. You spend your day analyzing people. So, you know. Have we got it all right? No, absolutely not. Have we made mistakes? Absolutely. But I never interview for skills, apart from sales. So because I think I'm a sales guy, if I'm interviewing a salesperson, then I check their sales skill. But 
you know, we have three salespeople at Bamboo. And of the 70 people, 67 have skills I know nothing about. You know, I know stuff about sales, running, a few other things, that's about it. And, 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 and then just so we have an understanding there, there I'm, I'm assuming cut into quite a lot of developers uh, and then quite a lot of people from finance and fin no, tech. So it's mainly a technology makeup. Yeah, I mean, the reason, so it's tech, marketing, kind of AI research, but we tried to employ people who didn't know wealth tech because if you employ people who already know stuff, you can't unteach them, right? But to your point, I interview everybody for attitude. You know the old saying, Lloyd, you can teach skills, you can't teach attitude, right? Yeah. And you know the greatest trick in the book, right? Go to for a coffee, and if they are not humble with the waiter, they never work in a bamboo. That's just a fact, right? It's just a fact. Somebody walks in with Harvard, MBA, McKinsey, Goldman, and they're rude to a waiter, we're done. We're over. That's it. No interest. Don't care. And it, it's not always, but what I look for is this. So when I interview people, I never asked about their career. I can read a CV. Why would I ask them about their CV? It's on their CV. I look at the bottom and find out what their hobby is. They like jazz, dancing, travel, food. And if it's food, I'm like, hey, how you doing? Great to see you. You know, I saw you like food. What kind of, I like Japanese. What do you like? Oh, have you been to Japan? That was awesome. And you can see really quickly, quite often people are like, yes, so I started my career at, I'm like, no, no, I want to know about you. I want to know that we get on. Can we be friends? And the reason is, if I can be friends with this per person and everyone else at Bamboo I employed and I, I like them, if I like them, they should like each other. So you build up this consistent and you know, look, and again, shout out to all the developers of Bamboo, love all of them. Is it cliche to say that sometimes developers can have a more reserved way of conducting themselves? It's not always true, but it's true. So it doesn't have to be everybody's like, oh, gung ho, let's do it. But yeah, I look for that good karma, respect, humble, honesty, hustle, hard work. You optimize for that. And last year, the Singapore government gave us FinTech Employer of the Year. And on Glassdoor, we're pretty much 100% positive reviews. So we've got a long way to go to do better, but we seem to be heading in the right direction. You, so there also, it's that that person's got, um, well, actually a, a hedge fund first ever said to me when they were looking, this is many, many years ago, they were looking for the most exceptional people, but a certain type of individual, where they said there's color off of the CV, right? They wouldn't employ somebody unless they were uh, on the weekends also a magician, right? They just wanted this, this, this bunch of contrarians who could look at something, which it sounds like you, you also have if people are coming from, from wealth tech. Uh, but then you're also looking for people who you feel are, they're good. They, have a good. they have a good set of values as well. Correct. And I think it's this idea, I rebel very strongly against the idea that we can, education is crazy important. So my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister all work at universities. So education is important. I've got an education, all good. But does an education define a superstar? I don't think so. Can you find superstars outside? I really think so. So on our job adverts, we don't say, must have a degree in 10 years experience. Honestly, some of our greatest products of bamboo are not built by the most experienced. We have some great people. I just think the narrative in is, oh, What's your education? Where have you been? Sure, that helps, but I would take the I would take the people that other people see me they won't look at. You know, oh, you had a career break? Awesome. You lived in Mongolia in a year for 10 years? Awesome. You know nothing about what we do? Even better. Like, and here's the one thing. As a salesperson, if any salesperson calls me, cold calls me and asks for a job, I will interview them. The amount of people, and can I have a 10 second rant? The amount of people who look for jobs by sending out the same email CV 50 times, they don't change it, and they just change the name and they think they're gonna get a job and they wonder why they don't. <sighs> yeah, that's the, that's the, um, that's one of the, in those coffee meetings that I have when I'm interviewing people, one of the things I'm looking for also, Ned, in addition to um, dependent on the client, whether it's, if it's, if it's for me, for sure, that this person's very passionate, um, and very curious because you need to be, and it's just going to make it more enjoyable. But um, I'm also looking for that they've come into it um, disgustingly well prepared. I would describe it like that. Um, you know, okay, so you want to be in search, cool. 
you know, that's a big market. You know, why would you want to be in technology and financial search? Better if you understand that quite well. Why would you specifically want to be working with us on our mission? Crucial that you've got a fantastically well thought through answer to that. Um, so you've got to have taken so much care about thinking about what you want to do because people are making, you know, two, three, five, seven year decisions with their career. And so you've got to be really precious about that. So at Mana Search, we're less about can we find a client in the short term, you know, a fix and more, can we make sure that this person's going to have an amazing career for the next medium long term? And so you've got to put so much more care into it. And I think people who are pinging out 50 applications, as a lot of grads are told to do, because career advice is terrible, um, you know, aren't paying the attention that they need to in their search. And, and, and if we take that into somebody who's got 10 years experience in a financial service business, and uh, you know, at that point you're weighing up a load more, aren't you? You might have anchors in terms of property and family, you might have a certain level of finance you need, then these are serious decisions. And um, you know, I really recommend that people are listening to a podcast like yours, perhaps ours, they're doing thorough research. When they're reaching out to somebody like you, they're not just saying, hey, Ned, give me a job. They might just be saying, could I have some time, Ned? I'd just really like to have a conversation with you. And from that, referrals can happen. And this is where the really perfect matches start to happen. Um, the point that you said, I wondered, uh, I wondered when you said it, if actually there's a negative, um, because if not, it's an obvious way to heart. If you've got 70 odd people who are all positive and are all able to be Ned's best friend. I mean, at some point you need to think about um, how can you keep being able to interview all of these people, right? And of course, if they all mirror your type of culture, other people can start doing that is, is the way to go. But right now, have you seen any challenges from having a bunch of positive people? And just to lead the question slightly, is it not useful sometimes to have um, people who are overly cautious? Is it not useful to sometimes, you know, if we use sales cliches, have, you know, the bad guy in the corner who's the top biller? Great question. We haven't got it all right, right? And you know, at Bamboo, we have been through the period where we had to let people go and I do that, right? If I employ somebody and it's time to let them go, I do it respectfully and in the right way and say, look, incredibly thank you, but it hasn't worked out and you know, we thank you for all you've done. And you know, we, we do give feedback when it's needed. So you know, we don't want to portray it's all you know, angels and pixie dust and everything at Bamboo's perfect, right? Absolutely not. But it's a good point. So my co-founder, so right at, the, you know, right at the core of our business are two incredibly different people. So me, and again, uh, I try not to think, I try just to do, if I keep believing, it will happen. That, that's just me, whether it's true or not, that's just my thought. My co-founder uh, from Finland, technology, people from Finland are much more realistic. They have this thing called Sisu. It's cold, hard, steely determination that the world's probably gonna suck and they should prepare for that. And then they can make it through with that. And, Aki, my co-founder is Aki Ranin. We are incredibly different. He is incredibly thoughtful and visionary, whatever, but and tech guy. But he comes from that perspective of, let's assume it will be slightly worse than reality. I live in a world where everything's amazing, right? And I'm often wrong and he's often wrong. So there is a balance. But to your question, is there a negative about not having the bad guy? Like sometimes I have to be the bad guy. Do I like doing it? No, it sucks. Do I do it? Yeah. Like, Unfortunately, I've run quite a few businesses and over my life have had to unfortunately let people go. It's not fun for them or for me, but particularly for them. And I understand, right? You can't just always be the best friend. You have to make tough calls. But to your question, do I think there's a negative of collecting a huge bunch of positive people and putting them in the right direction? Honestly, I don't. Let's say that um, somebody um, is having a really, uh, what I call high rising profile, they're in finance and um, they're not yet an MD uh, or above. Uh, and they're listening to this and um, you are you are ripping it up at Bamboo and in the next five years going to be synonymous with wealth tech. What would you um, advise these people? And they're positive, by the way, these guys. <laughs> uh, what would you advise them from your own experience uh, and, and skill set? to be the, the thing to do to make sure that they're also going to be incredibly successful. I don't know if this is the right quote, but again, 
I've started philosophy in my life if I think it, I say it. It's uh, something I'm, I'm a, quite a Ricky Gervais fan. I know not everybody is, but he has a philosophy in life. If you think it, say it, right? So there is a Woody Allen phrase that says, I think it was Woody Allen, maybe somebody different. I may have got that wrong. Anyway, it's a phrase. I have opinions, but if you don't like them, I can change them. And what I mean by that is, we've all got certain opinions on certain things we're quite strong on, right? So well, it doesn't really matter what they are. But let's say you're at work at HSBC and you're working on a wealth tech project, right? And you can see where it's going and you know it's going in that direction. Do your absolute best to be that person who is the solution. Even don't walk around and go, oh, you know, I don't think you've got to, if it's clear, it's on its way. When it's starting, make your voice, understand. But if it's clear, it's heading in a direction that it's going every day. So, uh, I'm, 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 you know, you know, in every sport, there's the guy that comes to the football field before practice, leave, the lights go out of the stadium, he's still there. But it's not just working hard, it's positive. Like you are, hey, I have an idea. Let's say that the, the person who's leading that project, you think of something, don't, don't say, hey, why don't you do that? Do it, present it, take it. We have somebody at Bamboo, he knows who he is, um, who once a month comes up with a whole new business for us, delivers it. <laughs> codes it, delivers it, creates it, and delivers it with no fanfare. So don't ask, don't expect, go the extra mile, be positive, be a supporter. And there's going to be times when you're like, yeah, look, I think this isn't quite right, but you know what? It's going that way. Get on the train, be that person when the lights go out, you're doing it. And the other one thing is I'm a massive believer in, and again, I, you know, karma, Dalai Lama, whatever, we're all the same, right? Don't ever assume that you either cattle to your boss or the person below you must cattle to you. Work in that. We're all the same. We're all doing the best. And go and get a coffee for the junior person in, in the company. So at Bamboo, we've all shareholders, including the lady who cleans our office. In Singapore, it's called our auntie, but it's like, you know, the tea lady. She's a shareholder. Keeping our office clean is just as important. And we treat her the same as everybody. And I think at banks, we end up with, oh, I'm going to be an MD. Why? Oh, because I'll have a team beneath me. No, you'll have a team with you. Great leaders, great captains, you know, and, and be that. You know, if, if you want to move up and your leader is somebody, enable him. Don't ask. Don't complain. Enable. And sometimes that means you have to do stuff you don't want to do. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I think about it. Perfectly well. And um, what I take from that is something I see uh, really successful people do, which is... Um, putting some preparation in to presenting the idea in preference to just having an immediate, um, you know, which might be a good thought with, with, your, with your superiors um, or the dev team or whoever it might be. Actually go away and do some work. Like when I, when I hire people and I'll set a task, when I get really excited about somebody's potential is if suddenly they turn up the next day with an Excel spreadsheet that just off the cuff they've put together and are like, Right, you see this thing, this thing, this thing. Right, that's all brilliant, but how about this thing? I'm like, oh, okay, now I'm excited about working with this person. You know, so that's super um, positive for people to do. And then, as you say, if you're going to want to get um, senior, you're going to need your team to really love working with you. With, with you, not for you, right? So um, clearly you've done that incredibly well. Um, with Bamboo, um, you know, staking everybody into the business, everybody feeling that their contribution is equal to the mission. So kudos to you there, Ned. Um, I think that you've covered so much brilliant stuff. I just wanted to really finish on a couple of things. We haven't had anybody from Singapore on the show and uh, it's a fantastic economy. Um, I don't have much understanding of how FinTech at large is going over there apart from that it seems to be um, perhaps slightly more immature than the European market. Uh, and by that, I just mean we don't have um, Yumonzo or Revolut yet. Um, we've, we've got perhaps the three, four years ago version, but perhaps if you could talk us through how you see FinTech in uh, Singapore at the moment and the part it has to play moving forward on a global scene. Yeah, I'm biased, so take this with a pinch of salt. And I've lived in Asia for 30 years, but I would, so Asia as a whole, China, miles ahead in FinTech, like 
we actually did a whole program on that, miles ahead of Silicon Valley anywhere, just how it is, right? Listen, we did a thing called Super Apps in China. I'll say Singapore, I, I would say that it has been one of the most progressive from an infrastructure. So what do I mean? The government and the regulator here have been clear for the last five years. We will support you. We will encourage you. We will do everything we can to bring companies here. There's new yeah. digital technologies. And you know the Singapore FinTech Festival last year? 60,000 people came. 60,000. And it was organized by the regulator. So organized by the regulator, 60,000 people. It was like a rock concert. It was crazy. And I think Singapore, we you know, very small country, clearly developed amazingly. But I think fintech is becoming the fourth pillar, you know, tourism, well, obviously during this current time, tourism perhaps not, but if we look over history, you know, exports, finance, tourism, right? Stuff, we're a port. So I would say this, for the Southeast Asia reason, region, the way that the Singapore government and the Singapore regulator have promoted companies here has been amazing. And we've got our super apps coming, Grab, Gojek, Razor. They might not be names you know there, but Grab, Gojek, which are uh, Gojek from Indonesia, which are uh, ride-hailing cabs becoming fintech, and Razor, which is a computer gaming hardware company, becoming a payments company. So uh, for, you know, sitting here, I see Singapore just firing on fintech, payments for sure. And, you know, we're in a small digital economy, you know, over 100% mobile. Most people have two. So I think we have like 101% mobile penetration, which seems ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, fintech is very mature, incredibly encouraged by the government, and it makes it a wonderful place to do business. And Ned, with um, Bamboo, um, it seems like you haven't done what a lot of uh, fintechs do, which is, um, and I'm not saying you, you're not doing this, but dominate their territory and then um, sprawl out of that geographically. You've already mentioned you've got um, US clients, which is fantastic. So you're going, you're going the other way around. You, you are based in Singapore, but this product is fit for purpose um, across the globe. And why, ha why have you taken that approach? Yeah, so my co-founder, Aki Randon, apart from being a, a, an amazing technical person, is a incredibly skilled writer. So if any if, if of you want to read some pretty amazing stories on Medium by Aki Rannan, R-A-N-I-N, he's done things like startup lessons from history from Napoleon, Plato, Musashi. Uh, so he, he, he looks at historical figures. Um, but he wrote an article called The Selfless Startup. And he said, at Bamboo, we have no strategy, no productivity, no bonuses, no bosses, no KPIs. So what do we mean? We mean that in a world of startups, it is relatively pointless. History shows us that the initial concept, apart from the very few startups, rarely is the end state. So why do we spend time thinking about what our strategy is? Every day we turn up for work and we know exactly what we do. We design and build saving and investment apps. We're not doing payments, not doing blockchain. We absolutely know what we do. Great. So then about six months in, a, a, a bank from Brazil called us and said, hey, we heard of Bamboo. Would you like to build us a saving investment app? Yes, we would. We would. Then we got a deal in America. Then we got a deal in UAE. Now we're building all over the world. And I think it just, oh, wow, we're global. Okay, and here's the point, completely different topic. So uh, my favorite hobby is ultra running. And in ultra running, it's a competition about how far you can run before you stop really, right? And the greatest phrase we use in ultra running is it's not gonna be how you thought it was gonna be. When you run a hundred miles, you can have good times, bad times, good, but you don't know when. It isn't gonna be how you thought it's gonna be. And we apply that to bamboo. We're incredibly focused and determined about what we do. So why do we end up global? Hey, you turn up every day, do your best, and it will be what it will be. You're, you're a massive dreamer. Um, you're going to get to this point where you've won the gold medal in wealth tech. Will, we, will you then move out of that and expand into further broader products? Oh, bamboo? I'm going to say absolutely not. No. Again, never say never, don't have a strategy, we don't know what life is going to be. I'm going to say no. <laughs> but, what my, but what my wife is scared of and what I'm scared of is, this is the greatest job I ever had. I, I've said it on every podcast, I've said, Ken Lloyd, I'm so lucky, I'm 53, now to be doing a job I absolutely love. You know what the problem is? It's the least I've ever been paid. So there's the rub, right? 
I love being an entrepreneur. It's amazing. It's financially silly unless I get a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So I might, bamboo will always be bamboo. Will I be here forever? Who knows? Will I ever stop being an entrepreneur? I have a scary feeling I never will. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that sums it all uh, up perfectly. Um, I um, wish you absolutely all the best in terms of um, getting that gold medal, Ned, over the next um, several years with Bamboo, and I'm sure, I'm sure you will. Um, was there anything you wanted to um, kind of finish on or, or talk to the audience about? Lloyd, look, thank you so much. I know you, you know, in the same way, you connected with me over the wonderful world of, you know, uh, technology. We had a good conversation before, and you know, I really appreciate the kind of, as we were talking, I, I get the same vibe from you, right? You've created a business, you're doing it with will and energy and passion. And you now look, I think, you know, I was asking myself this question. I was talking to my wife. I'm like, for whatever reason, it seems I'm okay at being an entrepreneur. So should I have started 30 years ago? But I might have sucked at it back then, right? I don't know. So here's what I'd finish on is, you know, it's never too late to, to try it. And you're right. What if I fail? You know, it's okay. I got a great experience. I didn't get paid for five years because that's how bamboo life works, right? You didn't get paid much. And I'll, I'll get another job. So I would finish on that to say that, you know, for anybody who's thinking about FinTech or WealthTech or any entrepreneur, of course, I get those realities of life, right? We all have to make money and living or whatever. But, you know, if you have enough belief to start to be an entrepreneur, I bet you, you can get a job again, right? Because if you have that inside you, if it goes wrong, You'll, you'll find a way out. So, look, Lloyd, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed chatting and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Absolute pleasure. Cheers, Ned. Thanks, Lloyd.